She's not a good fit for us. Laura shook her head. That's absolutely right. I don't understand why you're so categorical. You haven't even met Carol properly yet. Jeffrey shrugged. Why say not a good fit right away? Sweetie, I only need to look at a person to understand what they're like. You know I've worked with people my whole life. If I say she doesn't fit, it means she doesn't fit. Mom, you don't even know Carol. Jeffrey, who was usually compliant and gentle, stood his ground. Don't jump to conclusions. Her parents. Okay, his mother gave in, not listening to her son. Come over for dinner on Friday, we'll get to know each other. But I seriously doubt my opinion will change. Laura looked closely at her son. Is he really in love, she thought. It was quite unexpected. Her adult son was calm and predictable, never causing her problems. Laura herself was an active and energetic woman. She had her own grocery store and two stalls at the market, which required constant supervision and attention. Laura's ex-husband, Carlos, was similar to Jeffrey, or rather, Jeffrey was like him calm and balanced. Maybe too much so. He was passive and inactive. Laura was the one who took the initiative and made things happen. While he contemplated whether it was better to source products from wholesalers or directly from manufacturers, Laura learned everything from other vendors, rented a cargo truck, and secured a space. Now she had her own store, but back then, it was all just beginning. She had to drive to get the products herself, load the crates, and stand at the market with cucumbers and tomatoes. Most importantly, she had to listen to her husband's complaints about how she was doing everything wrong and his ideas about how things should be done. However, his ideas remained just that, ideas. Carlos didn't rush to set an example of how things should be done. By that time, their son Jeffrey had been born, and life became even more challenging for Laura. Her husband accused her of being a bad mother, claiming she didn't devote enough time to their son. One day, Laura realized that she had been managing everything on her own for a long time. She was running her small business, raising her son, and taking care of the household. Her husband worked as a junior research assistant at his institute, earning the minimum wage, wearing glasses, and acting self-important. There was no help from him, he continued to philosophize about how Laura was running her business incorrectly and believed that child-rearing and household chores weren't men's work, so he didn't help with those either. That's when Laura filed for divorce. They quickly divorced, and all the property belonged to Laura. Carlos went back to his mother, who couldn't stand Laura and thought she wasn't a suitable match for her educated son. Now, the two of them thought and discussed Laura together. However, this no longer interested the woman. Her small business was bringing in a decent income, her son was growing up obedient and smart, and they had moved from a cramped one-bedroom apartment on the outskirts to a spacious three-bedroom apartment in one of the best neighborhoods in the city. Jeffrey never caused his mother any problems. In daycare, he patiently waited for his mother in the duty group when the other children had already been picked up. In school, Jeffrey studied well, attended extended day programs, various clubs, and sections. He didn't excel in sports, but he became a district champion in chess, winning various competitions. He had particular success in mathematics. Despite her busy schedule, Laura always devoted a lot of attention to her son. She also kept a close eye on him, knowing all of his friends by name. Those who, in her opinion, could have a bad influence on her son were removed from his friends list. She knew where and with whom her son spent his free time, even though he had very little of it. Mother did everything to ensure that her son was engaged in productive activities rather than roaming the streets in search of adventure. Chess, swimming, tutoring, English courses, 
and driver's education required a considerable amount of time. Her son didn't object. He learned and developed. As expected, Jeffrey excelled in his exams and secured a spot with a scholarship at a prestigious university. He still lived with his mother, attended swimming classes and English courses. However, now he finally had some free time to spend with friends. Laura didn't know all of them as well as she used to, although she still tried to stay informed. Jeffrey continued to seek advice from his mother and shared what was on his mind. However, this time was different. Laura encountered her son and his acquaintance as she was leaving a cafe where she had just had a business meeting with a wholesaler. The young man and the girl, laughing carelessly, were entering the establishment just as Laura was exiting. The unfamiliar girl was holding Jeffrey's hand in a trusting manner, a detail that immediately caught Laura's eye. A regular friend wouldn't behave this way. Her son was gently hugging the girl by the shoulders. Laura etched every detail of what she saw into her memory. Back at home, Laura analyzed the unexpected encounter. They had merely exchanged greetings and then went their separate ways, but the woman noticed the light-colored nail polish on the girl's short, neat nails, her simple dress, and the absence of a professional manicure or hairstyling. The girl did not impress Laura. She seemed too plain. She probably came from some remote village in search of a wealthy and promising husband, like Jeffrey, thought the woman. Such a simpleton. The fact that her son had come to the defense of the stranger raised Laura's suspicions. Jeffrey usually didn't argue with her. He simply followed her instructions, as he believed that his mother wouldn't lead him astray. Something was clearly not going according to plan. The boy is growing up, sighed the woman. Well, no problem, we'll get through this. On Friday, Laura set a magnificent table with red caviar, succulent pork cutlets, and exquisite salads, everything one could desire. By six o'clock, Jeffrey arrived with Carol, the mysterious acquaintance he had mentioned as a wonderful girl. He had only said, you'll see for yourself when you meet her. Carol was dressed in a charming trouser suit that fit her perfectly. She sat down at the table while Laura served the dishes. She ate and praised. You cook so deliciously. Carol exclaimed. I, on the other hand, can't cook at all. Why not? You're not a teenager anymore, the hostess remarked. We don't cook like this at home, the girl gestured toward the table. I can make soup and cutlets, but all these fancy dishes are beyond me. It's okay, you can learn all of that with the desire, Laura chuckled. By the way, Carol, what do you do for a living? I work as a cashier in a supermarket, the girl proudly replied. I graduated from a trade college and I rent a small studio apartment. It's enough to get by. Why didn't you go back home after college? Laura squinted her eyes. What is there to do back there? I'm from a village. My older brothers have long moved to big cities and work in construction. My sister got married, had a son, got divorced, and returned to our parents. Even my younger brother came back to help with the farm. But I don't want to go back to the village. I like the hustle and bustle of the city. I'm not quite understanding something, Laura visibly tensed. There are five of us. Carol exclaimed joyfully. We're a big, close-knit family. Yes, a big one, the woman said. So, your parents don't help you at all, I assume? Why wouldn't they? I visit them on weekends, not every weekend, but still and I bring bags full of stuff from them, you can't even lift them. Potatoes, carrots, onions, tomatoes, cucumbers. But it's so cheap for us to buy all that. Why bother struggling? Laura was surprised. Every little bit helps, and it's free. Carol shrugged. Laura sighed. 
Her former mother-in-law also believed that having a garden was a lifesaver. The fact that you had to get there by train didn't bother her. Nor did the time and effort required to tend to it. There were also expenses for fertilizers, irrigation, pesticides, as well as time and money for transporting the produce back home. Laura had long realized that buying vegetables at the store was much more cost-effective. However, not everyone shared her view. Carol left, but Laura couldn't shake a certain ambivalence. On one hand, she felt sorry for the girl. Her life seemed to have been anything but easy. It was clear that she wasn't lazy and could fend for herself. On the other hand, she had hoped that her son would marry a suitable bride, someone from his own social circle, with money and education. She had dreamed that he wouldn't have to go through everything she had experienced. I told you that Carol is fantastic. Jeffrey declared from the doorway, having just returned home after seeing the girl off in a taxi. What's so fantastic about her? A big family or the poverty she's living in, the woman scoffed. Mom, why do you have to be like this? Carol is a really good girl. I want to marry her, and she's not living in poverty. Her parents. Listen, Jeffrey, his mother interrupted him. Why don't you consider someone like Jennifer, for example? You've said before that she'd make the perfect wife, smart, educated, and beautiful. And her family is quite respectable. Her father works for a big company, and her mother owns a bridal salon. Mom, I don't love Jennifer. Yes, she's beautiful, wealthy, and educated, but I prefer Carol, Jeffrey shrugged. She's more to my liking than Jennifer. To your liking, Laura grumbled. She didn't yet know what to do with this love, but she wasn't going to just let things unfold on their own. Especially when Jennifer as a potential daughter-in-law was far more appealing to her. Being related to such a family would be a great fortune. Mom. Carol is going to live with us, Jeffrey said while finishing his sandwich, glancing at his mother. The apartment she was living in is being sold, and it's not easy to find another place quickly. Carol doesn't have much money, so finding a suitable option is complicated. Maybe she should go back home? Laura retorted. What's she going to do here? Mom, Carol is my fiancé. We plan to file the marriage registration application in a few days. If you're against it, I'll rent an apartment for us. After all, I have a good income, and we'll manage. Laura thought for a moment, weighing all the pros and cons, and spoke to her son with a completely different tone. Jeffrey, don't get worked up. Of course, let her stay if it happened this way. She's your fiancé, after all. Just don't rush with the registration. You've made the right decision. Live together. Give it a try. Get used to each other. Then you can go to the registry office. Mom, you're the wisest woman. Jeffrey exclaimed, kissing her on the cheek. I'll go make Carol happy and help her move her things. Of course, the wisest, Laura muttered. How could it be otherwise? Carol moved into their apartment with three suitcases and a potted plant. This is aloe, she explained. It's medicinal. I grow it on purpose. Let it stay in your room, Laura said, inspecting the spiky plant, which didn't particularly excite her. She didn't have the time to take care of indoor plants. The next day, Laura went out on business, Jeffrey went to school, and Carol stayed at home as she had the day off. When Laura returned, the girl had prepared a pot of soup, pilaf, and juice. Everything was delicious, but there was too much of it. Carol, we can't eat this much, Laura looked at the three-liter pot of borscht. I understand that you come from a big family, but eating borscht and pilaf for a whole week doesn't excite me at all. I'm sorry, I wanted to do better, the girl whispered and blushed. Laura felt embarrassed. She didn't want to hurt Carol, but she also didn't want to out to her. 
After all, this girl had come into her home. Let her live by her own rules. Carol did many things differently, not in the way Laura was used to. The girl often cooked pasta and bought convenience food so she wouldn't have to bother, as she put it. Carol, I understand that with a big family, it makes sense. But there are just three of us, and we can prepare a delicious and healthy dinner without much effort. The son's fiancé nodded but usually did things her own way. Carol loved to play loud music. She did everything to the beat of cheerful, modern melodies, which annoyed Laura. She hated pop music, as it reminded her of the times when she had to stand in the market in the heat and cold, with cheerful, popular tunes playing all around. Laura asked Carol to lower the volume, and she did. However, soon she forgot Laura's request and turned the music up again. After work, Carol hurried home. She bought groceries, usually discounted items that Laura preferred not to buy. She had dinner with Jeffrey, who patiently waited for her, and they both retired to their room. From there, muffled conversations and laughter could be heard for a long time. Laura was nervous because Jeffrey had to go to college early the next day, which meant he needed to wake up early. However, Carol, as she saw it, didn't give him a chance to rest. Predictably, Jeffrey passed his exams with two Bs. Jeffrey, how could you? You were on track for a summa cum laude. It's all Carol's fault. She's not letting you study. Laura raged. What does Carol have to do with it? I admit I got a bit careless, but it's my fault. And I'll still get the red diploma. After all, they allow five Bs, you know, Jeffrey replied. Fine, my son. Let's aim for two more Bs in your last semester, and you'll say goodbye to that red diploma. Laura couldn't calm down. Mom, I'll do better, Jeffrey said. I'll get your red diploma, find a job, and then Carol and I will get married. Carol's parents don't mind. This is your diploma. You've been working towards this for almost five years, and it's so close, sighed the woman. She tried not to think about the upcoming wedding. Jeffrey eventually earned a summa cum laude. He was invited to work at a reputable company with a good salary. Laura was proud of her son and told everyone that it was her doing, both the diploma and the job. In some ways, she was right. Mom, we're invited for a visit, Jeffrey popped into his mother's room. Carol's father has a birthday tomorrow, which is a perfect occasion to discuss our wedding. Son, go without me, I have so much work to do, Laura frowned. She understood that her son's wedding was inevitable. He loved Carol, and she loved him. It was clear as day. The young couple got along well, never argued, and found compromises. However, Laura tried to postpone this unpleasant event, her son's wedding to this provincial girl. That's why she didn't rush to meet the parents of the future bride. Mom, they're waiting for all of us, Jeffrey insisted. We submitted the application to the registry office yesterday. The wedding is in a month. We need to make some decisions. In a month? Laura exclaimed in confusion. Her vague someday had suddenly gained a timeline. Why didn't you tell me anything? Because I'm tired of your wait. Think, don't rush. I love Carol, and she loves me. It's that simple. Get ready, Mom. We're going to meet my new relatives and plan the wedding. After all, such an event happens once in a lifetime. What is there to plan with them? The woman suddenly flared up. Everything will be as we decide. After all, we're paying for the celebration. What's there to plan with them? They have five cows, an orchard, and cows. Well, go have a look at the cows then. Jeffrey angrily said, turned around, and left. Laura couldn't get over her conversation with her son for a long time. 
It was a warm summer morning. The sun was slowly rising above the horizon. Birds were chirping, villages and settlements flew by as the travelers headed towards them. Jeffrey was driving the car, chatting with Carol, and occasionally looking back at his mother. Laura was still upset with her son, but she reluctantly joined the trip to meet the future in-laws. They had set out at dawn. Laura brought some red fish and seafood for their table. She thought, they probably haven't tried such delicacies here. As a gift, she also brought a bottle of moderately priced cognac, understanding that Carol's father might not be able to appreciate the drink properly. They traveled for a long time, and Laura even managed to doze off. It was only closer to lunchtime after six hours of driving that they arrived at the village. The village was located by a wide river near the forest. Laura admired the local scenery. She hadn't spent much time in nature lately. The village itself was beautiful, wide streets, spacious houses with large windows, lots of greenery and flowers. Laura was surprised. She had expected to see a remote, desolate village, but instead found something entirely different. Her amazement tripled when they arrived at Carol's parents' house. We've arrived. Jeffrey stopped the car in front of a large three-story brick cottage. Laura followed Carol and Jeffrey as they crossed the broad courtyard paved with stone tiles and entered the large house. Laura was taken aback. The house had been extensively renovated, furnished with new furniture, had stretched ceilings, and a robot vacuum working in the adjacent room. It was nothing like what she had envisioned for her future in-law's home. A little boy ran towards them, climbed into Carol's arms, and started babbling in a language only he understood. This is my nephew, Carol explained to those present. Hello, we've been looking forward to seeing you. A younger woman of indeterminate age emerged from the kitchen. Her manicure, pedicure, hairstyle, and attire were all on point. I'm Amanda, Carol's mother. And I assume you're Laura? We've already met Jeffrey. Please, make yourselves at home. The other guests will arrive around three. The woman led them to a white living room. A white fluffy carpet adorned the floor. A luxurious soft corner sofa was a couple of shades darker. White lace curtains hung on the windows, and black and white framed photographs adorned the walls. On the glass coffee table, there was a white vase with fragrant white lilies. To say that Laura was shocked would be an understatement. Edward's jubilee was celebrated in a large carved gazebo in the yard. The table was adorned with red fish, seafood, and cognac, among other things. It was much better and more expensive than what Laura had brought. It seemed that the entire village had gathered to congratulate the jubilarian. There were toasts, songs, and dances, but everything was jovial and decent. The next day, Edward and Amanda showed their prospective in-laws around their estate, enormous greenhouses full of vegetables and two filled with strawberries. Carol's parents were also involved in raising Dutch cows with a small private cheese-making facility. Everything, from the greenhouses to the small farm, was equipped with the latest technology. The cheese-making room was spotless. Laura learned that Carol's parents were local and quite successful farmers, and they received help from their children, their daughter and youngest son, who had graduated from a technical college and trained to be a tractor driver. Carol herself wasn't simple either. She not only graduated from a trade college, but also continued her studies through distance learning at the university. Why didn't you tell me who Carol's parents were? Laura asked her son when they were alone. You said yourself that you can determine what kind of person someone is at first glance. So I decided to give you a chance to decide for yourself. Listen, but the discounted items, cheap things, and the cashier job? And Carol's family, they don't flaunt their wealth. They prepared the festive dishes for a special occasion, like birthdays. 
Most of the time, they eat regular food and often rely on convenience items. They don't have much free time to spend hours cooking. To help with this, they have to visit and lend a hand. Carol and I would come to help Edward in the greenhouses every other week. So that's why your friends invited you over? Laura sighed. So this is why Carol doesn't get a manicure? She guessed. You can't work in the greenhouses with long nails. Yes. We were here for a week last month. We had to harvest the crop. You thought we went to a resort. Jeffrey laughed. You could have given me a heads up, the woman replied, still feeling hurt. I felt like a complete fool. I brought red fish, and here they have all kinds of it. Salmon, trout, and even cognac. What a shame. I thought I was heading to a backward village, but it's more civilized here than in the city. I tried, Mom, honestly. I tried several times, but you didn't want to listen, Jeffrey chuckled. Laura just shrugged. She never imagined she could be so wrong. Carol turned out to be a true princess, almost like Cinderella. Carol's parents and Laura resolved all the wedding matters. The celebration was decided to be held here, considering the spaciousness and the beauty of the surroundings. Carol, in her white ball gown, looked like a real princess from a fairy tale. The couple received an apartment in a residential area as a gift from their parents for the wedding. Laura gained another reliable source of fresh vegetables and fruits. She, Carol's parents, and Carol became not only family but also business partners. The entire experience taught Laura not to jump to conclusions about people as the story with her daughter-in-law had taught her many valuable lessons.